Well, good evening, everybody, or wherever you are, whatever time of day it is for you. Welcome, welcome to this online event, Story Listening, Narrative Evidence and Public Reasoning, uh, which is being hosted by the Bennett Institute for Public Policy at the University of Cambridge. We are um, committed to interdisciplinary academic and policy research into major challenges facing the world today and to the skills needed for public service. So my name is Diane Coyle, I'm the Bennett Professor of Public Policy, and it's a real pleasure to host the launch of this new book, Story Listening, by Claire Craig of the University of Oxford and Sarah Dillon, my colleague at the University of Cambridge. And in a moment, I'm going to turn to them to introduce the book and its themes to you. And then after that, we're going to be joined by a very distinguished panel, Professors Genevieve Lively, Peter Gluckman and Mike Hume, who I'll say a little bit more about later. And they're going to reflect on the role of stories in respectively public humanities, scientific advice and climate change debates. So the usual bit of housekeeping first. Um, could I ask you uh, to put questions in the Q&A at the bottom? And uh, I will pick up as many of those as I possibly can. Uh, we'll have plenty of time towards the end for uh, some questions and comments. And um, uh, I'll see whether we've got time to ask you to uh, speak them out or if I'm going to read them out. There is a Twitter hashtag, hashtag story listening. So if you feel moved, please tweet about it. And there are also closed captions available with the uh, button at the bottom of the screen. But first of all, I'm going to turn to our two main guests, both people I've known for quite a long while now. Dr. Claire Craig is the Provost of Queen's College, Oxford, and has a uh, vast experience of providing scientific evidence to senior decision makers. And uh, Sarah Dillon is my colleague, Professor of uh, Literature and the Public Humanities in the English Faculty at Cambridge, and um, uh, is a scholar of contemporary literature, film and philosophy. So they're both going to start by talking about the book and um, will I think be sharing a screen. So Claire, I believe you're starting. So please do go ahead and share the screen and take us into this event. Thank you very much. Uh, so, am I now seeing screen sharing effectively? You see your screen, but if you could put it in to... slideshow mode, that would be good. Absolutely. Right. So, thank you. Um, so, uh, in public reasoning, it's a, a, a truth uh, universally acknowledged that, uh, that stories matter. But particularly when it comes to uh, considering the use of research-based evidence in public reasoning. Um, policymakers and experts rarely ask more how or why or what to do as a result. And some of the reluctance may come from the, um, the way in which, uh, the fear, if you like, of stories kind of unruly power um, that uh, because they operate by appealing both to mind and heart, that a powerful narrative in full flood is, is kind of unstoppable without regard to whether it's positioned as, as fiction or non-fiction, um, as uh, capable of being judged as true or false or reasonable or um, unreasonable. Uh, and another challenge is that because of their ubiquity, um, stories are approached through a very wide variety of dis disciplines, each with um, different uh, kinds of angles on what they do and how that matters. So what Sarah and I have done is developed a framework that teases out four uh, functions of stories, um, and which we hope is the start um, of further innovative practice and of, um, and of research. Um, however, we found it's uh, almost invariably uh, that uh, when we start um, talking with people about about this, um, that uh, they still want they still think about storytelling, um, uh, and what whereas what we're talking about is the act, the conscious and reflecting uh, act of creating narrative evidence. So we uh, we created our own word, story listening, um, to signal that something potentially unexpected is, is going on. And story listening is the theory and practice of gathering narrative evidence to inform uh, decision making, particularly in public reasoning, and always, always as part of a pluralistic evidence base. And, and um, it's worth also pointing out um, that this is about cognitive functions uh, rather than effective ones like empathy about which there's much written elsewhere. Um, and it's about collective functions, not about impacts on um, individual um, readers or um, listeners. 
So um, the first of our four functions um, is about creating multiple points of view. Um, and these are points of view in the sense of uh, ways in which, um, which inform uh, policy, uh, the framing of policy debate and of the target systems uh, that are considered to be important to it. So in this diagram, um, an imbiber, by imbiber we have to say imbiber because a person might be reading or listening or, um, or watching a story, um, it, it, imbibing a story um, uh, takes in um, different perspectives that foreground different parts of the target system, the system that's taken to matter for the framing of the policy debate. And as it were, imbibing the story changes and understanding of what that uh, target system, what parts of the target system matter. Story listening then scales that up across imbibers and across stories to draw out um, different uh, aspects of the, uh, of the um, system under question of the framing. Um, an example um, uh, might be, for example, uh, with the many stories about alien intelligences, they convey something of the breadth of ways in which intelligences might be redefined in the light of machine learning. Um, but it, importantly, some explore societal engagement with distributed intelligence, which is a very different sort of point of view from rather superficially perhaps fixating on uh, potential humanoid uh, entities, which are easier to conceptualize uh, and use in headlines, uh, but are much less uh, relevant, at least for now, to policy. The second function is around the uh, identification and creation of collective identities. So what story listening is doing there is enabling us better to explore what those identities are and what they mean. So if you take a novel um, like um, Flight Behavior or Zaytun uh, to take two, um, uh, then um, these are, um, in these particular instances, they uh, show the intersection between collective identities, uh, scientist, entrepreneur, family member, religious practitioner, in systems that are dealing with the impacts of climate change. To take a very different example, in uh, researchers, like all human beings, uh, work and live within uh, narrative networks that inform their collective identities and the directions of their research and uh, what they take to matter. Um, so this might matter in public reasoning where, for example, um, it raises questions about the collective identities in the wider context, like the IPCC. So we just took a particular look uh, in more depth at, at one IPCC report from 2019, um, showing how the framing, um, the, the collective identity around uh, the physical sciences, um, it, it, by choice, dominates, therefore, uh, the types of evidence that are drawn in to that part of the evidence that then informs the larger debates. If you'd go on to the next slide. Um, the third function is model. So all um, public reasoning rests on an implicit model of the system under scrutiny. Uh, a, a good model is a useful abstraction of the real world that enables some sort of surrogative reasoning about it. Um, and stories already play an integral part in the creation and use of scientific non-narrative models in areas like climate change or economics or epidemiology, most uh, pertinently at the moment. But they also, they also function as narrative models in their own right. So if you take the novels of, um, of Jane Austen that give today's reader some sense of the rules of the game, if you like, governing middle-class um, uh, social life in Regency England, um, in a somewhat similar way, a novel like Kim Stanley Robinson's Aurora, which Sarah will talk about briefly uh, in a moment, uh, explores a social model of a zero waste world um, and its implications um, in, in that way. In, in some sense, stories are uh, may, uh, in some instances, be the only way of collectively thinking through uh, potential behaviours of complex systems. So together with scientific advice, and we're never saying it's one or the other, uh, they extend the scope of the ensembles of models that are available um, for the public reasoning. Can we go on to the fourth um, uh, function, please? Uh, so finally, stories also enable new forms of anticipation. So in the 1990s, many novelists anticipated the economic shock of the 2000s. And in his most recent work, uh, Robert Schiller talks about stories as functional elements of anticipation of market uh, behaviors. And in the second half of the 20th century, uh, stories like uh, On the Beach, we've shown there, alongside quantitative modeling of death rates, attempted various versions of narrative futures models of the consequences of nuclear war. Because 
stories uh, are in some ways more accessible than other forms of evidence. So if they're very carefully handled, their incorporation within a pluralistic evidence base may also enable new and uh, perhaps more inclusive forms of public engagement alongside deliberation, which is an area where many of us have been um, trying new forms of practice. Um, so thank you for that. If you can stop me, um, uh, your, your um, slide sharing, that'd be great. I just finally wanted to um, call attention to one thread across the four functions, which is how um, the most charismatic stories draw attention to themselves um, and away from the spaces around them, rather like charismatic numbers or charismatic images actually do. And those kind of narrative deficits and locked in framings may impoverish the uh, full examination of full sets of the entire system or sets of models um, or of futures in public debate uh, and also exclude some collective identities while prioritizing others so we're arguing that through careful story listening amongst other things uh, that can show up those spaces and and, and bring in uh, new uh, ways of tackling uh, established issues but thank you i'll hand over to sarah Hello everyone, thank you Claire. Can you see my slideshow okay? We can, yes. Wonderful. Okay, I'm just gonna carry on from uh, where Claire's left off. Um, so story listening, which uh, uh, to, to remind you, cause it's a new word, uh, the theory and practice of gathering narrative evidence to inform decision-making. It requires general narrative literacy on the part of publics and experts and decision-makers. It requires the evolution of systems for incorporating rigorous evidence into public reasoning, and it requires the evolution of the humanities, and I'm going to talk to those three things briefly. So, um, put simply, narrative literacy um, is understanding how stories function and their effects at individual and collective levels. So scientists, decision makers and publics need to be narratively literate to avoid false certainty about the role of stories and to help them know when to bring in expertise. So just as a generalist handles a bank account or carries an umbrella but wouldn't attempt to model future interest rates or global average surface temperature, there's a need to seek expert advice on what stories are saying. So story listening therefore requires both basic narrative literacy on the part of the decision maker and the advice of narrative experts who are highly skilled in analysing and interpreting the functioning of stories. And that's where scholars from the humanities come in. So experts from the sciences have played um, uh, advi uh, played advisory roles in relation to evidence gathering for some time and um, that role has become very visible to lots of lay publics over the last uh, year or so. But advisory structures need to evolve to better incorporate humanities knowledge. And this might mean, for instance, the regular inclusion of humanities knowledge in mechanisms for evidence synthesis. For example, um, the UK's uh, SAGE or the IPCC. And it means the need for long-term relationships between humanities academics and those involved in public reasoning. Relationships that really importantly enable collaboration while keeping space for opposition. And it means developing what Claire's already mentioned, a pluralistic evidence base, one that takes account of narrative evidence in addition to other forms of evidence. And one of the themes of the book is very much both and rather than either or. As well as these um, practical moves, the incorporation of evidence from the humanities requires a conceptual shift to recognizing that the hum humanities in fact do produce knowledge, even though our methods of doing so might differ from those in the sciences. And here we in the humanities can help ourselves, I think, by getting better explaining what we mean by rigor in our fields and by demonstrating the importance of using methods that are appropriate to the object of study. So one would no more use a synchrotron to study a story than one would use narratology to study an atom. But both stories and atoms form part of the fabric of our world. The humanities might also shift from the embedded notion of the lone public intellectual to a more pervasive understanding of the role of the public humanities. And this is another both and move. Engagement is needed in, in addition to opposition. At least some parts of the humanities need to be willing and able to collaborate with the structures of public reasoning and decision making. 
And to, to engage here is not to relinquish the possibility of critique on which many defences of the public value of the humanities have often rested. Although it may well provide new insights and understandings that prompt a reflection on the beliefs and the assumptions that are underlying critique. So both independence and engagement are needed. Now, in closing this uh, introduction, we wanted to give you a brief example of what we call in the book performative readings. And Claire mentioned earlier Kim Stanley Robinson's novel, Aurora. Some of you may have read it. It's a novel from 2015, and it follows the story of a group of human beings who inhabit a large life-sustaining ship, which generations earlier left Earth in search of a new planet to inhabit. The ship's operated and overseen by an AI, and its inhabitants are required to manage it's every resource in its closed system with meticulous care. Now we propose that the story can be understood as a narrative model to take one of the functions of use to public reasoning in at least two ways. So the novel's imagining of a sophisticated artificial general intelligence that has achieved consciousness and makes independent judgments regarding its role in governing the human population of the ship is hypothetical at present. And thus in this respect, the novel would be functioning as an anticipatory narrative model that it might enable reasoning about possible future inter interaction between AI and governments. But if Aurora's target system, that which it's modeling is taken to be Earth and its human inhabitants, then the novel serves as a useful mimetic narrative model in relation in particular to climate change. So it prom prompts its readers to consider possible policy responses in recreating the closed system that is Earth on an imagined interplanetary relocation ship, Aurora models the resource, skills, and behaviors and governance challenges and options that Earth is currently facing, but which both individuals and collectives have been slow or resistant to confront, countenance, and address. So narrative evidence gathered by story listening to Aurora might therefore use usefully be placed alongside, and you can see we've, we've done this for you visually in the slide, the consideration of planetary boundary arguments from other fields, again, as part of a pluralistic evidence base in public reasoning about climate change. So climate change and, and COVID-19 are amongst the signals, not weak signals, that humanity needs to change and to adapt over the next few decades. And it needs all possible forms of evidence to help it do that. What is needed now, we argue, and we hope you might uh, take uh, heed the call, What's needed now is for innovative practitioners to start asking for the narrative evidence that might be relevant to their specific and pressing questions and for researchers to take on the challenge of creating it. Back to you, Diane. Thank you so much, Claire and Sarah. Um, in a while, we'll turn to audience questions, so please do start putting your questions in the Q&A box um, as, as, as they come to you. And um, we, we're going to turn next to the panel, but I can't resist um, putting one question to you myself. I'm an economist by training, and um, economists dis disguise their narratives with algebra, and I think many, despite Robert Schiller's book, are quite resistant to the idea that you persuade, you get policy formed on the basis of, of narratives or anything other than reason and quantitative evidence. And of course, narratives aren't always seen as positive. There used to be this phrase in politics about controlling the narrative, which actually meant manipulating people's perceptions. So how do you respond to that kind of challenge or resistance to the arguments that you're making? I don't know which of you would want to pick that up. I'm unmuted, so I'll, I'll take the floor. Um, it's, it's a good question. It's one that we've had over the past few years. It's one uh, that we encountered in uh, uh, the generous and extensive peer review that the first draft of the book went out to. I think it's to reiterate Claire's point made at the beginning, that this is not a book about storytelling. It's not a book about using um, narrative to persuade. Uh, the Winton Centre at Cambridge is doing a wonderful job of thinking about narratives and persuasion and evidence. Um, it's a book about what you do if you're a decision maker and you want to understand and gain knowledge about the world from as wide a range of, of reliable sources as you can. So it's a, it's a different side of the debate, um, which is not to skirt the question, but to say that that's not, that wasn't our starting point. But Claire may well have something else to add. I, I, think, I think it's exactly that, that um, because stories are used in the ways that horrify 
um, economists when they're uh, sort of feeling their most rational and, and kind of numerate because they are used in that way and have that kind of functions is not a reason not to look beyond that and consider how they're operating in these other ways, these more cognitive ways, if you like. Um, and in fact, of course, any model, even a quantitative model, and, and people like Mary Morgan work on this in the philosophy of science, any model already has narratives incorporated in it because it's set up to answer certain types of questions um, and and indeed uh, in order to understand its answers there was they, it, 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 you have to, they have to be conveyed in stories in some way so stories and models are intertwined even um, e e even for economists so it's better perhaps to acknowledge that and not consider that there are two completely separate worlds I do agree with you I'm uh, uh, ventriloquizing my profession here um, it's time to turn to our uh, expert panel, and so we've got three fantastic commentators, um, Professor Genevieve Lively, Professor of Classics at the University of Bristol, and a narratologist, which is a new term to me on um, uh, thinking about this, and she is interested in uh, narratives and how they affect futures thinking. Professor Peter Gluckman, President of the International Science Council and Director of I'm going to mispronounce this, I'm sure, Koi Tu, the Centre for Informed Futures and in New Zealand, a paediatrician and biomedical scientist with vast experience in public policy. And Professor Mike Hume, Professor of Human Geography at the University of Cambridge, who's exploring the idea of um, addressing climate change through different means. So I'm going to ask you each in turn, and if you um, can take about five minutes and hand on directly to each other rather than back to me, that would be fantastic. So. Genevieve, over to you to start, please. Thank you so much. Great to uh, be hearing um, uh, Karen and Sarah talk about the, their insights into this exciting domain. Um, I'm going to kind of just reflect briefly on what this notion of story listening might mean for uh, the humanities. Um, and it reminds me that in the arts and humanities, we've been thinking about, we've been championing and interrogating the role of stories and storytelling uh, forever and a day. That's how it seems to me. And we look back to ancient Athens and the foundation of the academy there. We find Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, you know, the original dead white men, um, really taking seriously the power of narrative to, to, to drive change, to shape society for good and for ill from their perspectives. And that focus on storytelling uh, remains a key area of research, of course, um, across the, the arts and humanities. Um, it's it become a key driver in public and policy engagement uh, with humanities researchers. And while the, the so-called narrative turn um, has firmly established story, and again, storytelling as a key focus, in the social sciences too. Um, Google it, I'm sure you have plenty of time on your hands, but storycraft is big business um, in policy making, in, in, in business itself, in medicine, the list um, goes on and on. Storycraft absolutely established as big business. This is across these various disciplines. But what has been undervalued for, you know, two and a half thousand years at least, I think, undervalued, under-researched, is the cognate activity of what Sarah and Claire call story listening. This is really turning the game on its head. Um, and the role that stories play when we come at them from the, the story listener, or to use the beautiful phrase, the story imbiber perspective, we get a very different sense of the narrative dynamics at work in the world building that narratives play such a prominent role in. The role here I'm thinking that stories play in the deep understanding of ourselves and our place in the world. The role of narrative not only in communicating ideas, might include policies um, in this notion, but in basic sense making, in community building, in identity building, and as Sarah has alluded to, in futures making, futures shaping. And this means stories aren't just nice to have, they're absolutely essential um, into what all of us do. Um, and I think it's particularly through story listening to take a step away from the busyness of storytelling, only through story listening, that we start to open up some new insights 
into our relationships with volatile, uncertain and complex futures that are, that are facing us through the, the, the sort of channels that are focused on in the book. So climate crisis, um, our engagement with, with AI and emerging technologies, to name just two. By recognising that speculative and science fictions, to take just a couple of examples here, provide a rich canon of futures imaginings and scenarios that we can use to practically refine and hone our skills in anticipatory thinking and even strategic foresight I think is, is crucial and emerges so strongly through the book. Um, by better understanding that role of story listening and the way that narrative archetypes, genres and forms impact upon audiences, I think we can better understand both the possibilities and the limitations of the human imagination when it comes to futures thinking across various domains. I want to wrap up with um, an example, which I think has, has, has hit um, home across, um, across the world, really. Um, the Blue Planet uh, uh, sort of, uh, narratives that emerged back in 2017, the, that iconic image of, of a young whale trapped in plastic, that one rich character um, enabled a conversation to begin across the globe um, about, about plastics in the ocean and sparked um, activists across the globe to, to try and do something about it. But I think story listening encourages us to do is to take narratives like that and try and think about how we could use them for good um, across the political um, domain to try and drive um, forces and, and dynamics for good. So um, you will have gathered from this. I am a huge uh, fan of just turning the dial and to focusing on story listening um, as much as storytelling. I'm gonna hand over to um, the next uh, kind of panel member who's going to add their reflections. I think I'm handing over to Mike, but Diane will correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was Peter, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Claire and I have spent much of our recent lives talking and writing about evidence-informed policymaking. But the word evidence itself is a contested word. Scientists may see evidence as that knowledge which arises from scientific inquiry and reason, and as a result, the reports too often tend to be detailed to a level designed to show off their level of expertise more than to inform the reader. But as Claire and Sarah's book highlights, storytelling and listening are not the same. And, and indeed, when one thinks through what evidence means for non-scientists or the politician, there are many other forms of evidence. For the politician, anecdotes, personal observation, and advice from a taxi driver or constituent are compelling forms of evidence. For others, it may be religious belief or tr community tradition or local knowledge, or it may be a story that they've heard, fictional or not. And who these days, for many, who can tell the difference? It's interesting that all these other forms of evidence are, in fact, stories. And the science advisor needs to be aware of these stories. For the science advisor, the narrative has to be clear about what is now scientifically known and what is not. I was the first science advisor to the New Zealand government. I was very surprised by the very narrow focus of the emerging management system, focused largely on earthquakes, floods, and biosecurity, with no systematic understanding or consideration of other risks. Over the years, I've made a number of forays to try and get a systematic review of risk in the form of a risk register, as you have in the United Kingdom. My analytical arguments failed. But in about 2014, there was a large solar flare that hit Montreal. It did not hit New Zealand, but it gave me a chance. I started to lay out to ministers and to officials the scenarios if it had hit New Zealand. I was telling stories. And of course, scenario setting is just one form of storytelling, and the listening effect was palpable. Within months, a risk committee had been established and a much more comprehensive approach started, something I've written about in my own story elsewhere. At the moment, I chair the International COVID Roadmap Project 
led by the International Science Council with partnerships with the United Nations Disaster Risk Reduction Organization and the World Health Organization. The exercise is aimed at highlighting the much broader consequences of the pandemic in areas from in areas ranging from of obviously health through social, educational, economic, political, geostrategic, environmental uh, domains and beyond. And it will report in the next few weeks. But to describe this vast array of potential outcomes, an analytical approach is impossible, given the many vectors of uncertainty that lie there. But descriptive scenario setting for different settings in those uncertainties can shift the understandings of the policy community to a much broader range of issues that they will now need to confront over the next age. And COVID's told us something else, it's namely the rhetorical power of pictures and numbers. We've seen the television captured by language such as flattening the curve and very precise modeling, which has been presented as certainty rather than discussing uncertainties. That's not wise. Explaining our uncertainties, which the narrative does, is something we need to do much better and a narrative and scenarios create a far more honest picture than singular numbers. In a minute, Mike's going to talk to you about climate change. If you look at the IPCC, it produces enormous complexity and every word is vigorously debated in Talmudic detail. In a language, I suspect nobody but the most dedicated climate policy wonk can really love. Yes, we need climate science, but as I said at the COP meeting just two weeks ago, we're hiding the, from the wood from the trees because the story we tell is not being heard. The dominant stories are about personal futures in time and space, not about immediacy and local. And we need to shift that. We need to get away from risk telling to my new word, risk listening a new language I've stolen from Sarah and Claire. We have a crisis in science. Trust in empirical knowledge is being undermined by a virtual manipulated information world. A new dimension in many ways, a new form of occult perhaps. While science has never been apolitical, the politicization of science has taken on a new meaning. But honest and effective stories that are heard and listened to may be part of rebuilding that trust. The existential risks, if we can't do that, are real. And I'll pass on to Mike. Thank you. So in 2014, the then chair of the IPCC, uh, Dr. Pachari, at the press conference of the launch of the fifth assessment report, he, he remarked this. He said, all we need is the will to change, which we trust will be motivated by an understanding of the science of climate change. I often use that quote in my own work and writing because it draws attention to what I've now for quite a long time regarded as a, a fundamental problem at the heart of the politics of climate change, which is that science, getting the science right, getting the numbers precise, communicating the science to audiences, whether in policy or in publics, that holds the key to unlocking the challenges and the policy dilemmas and the geopolitics of climate change. Science, it is science and the understanding of science that will motivate change. And so, because I've been very critical of that stance, this is why I find Claire and Sarah's book on story listening just so apt and important um, for a whole range of public policy issues, but climate change uh, certainly is one of those. It does a number of things for me. Uh, it draws attention to the inadequacy of what is sometimes called the science deficit model, or rather the, the deficit model of science communication, uh, that it, it is really the problem that publics just don't get the science. And there are all sorts of reasons why they don't get the science. Uh, it's bad communication by uh, inadequate scientists. It's nefarious interests within the media or in the fossil fuel industry. But if we could just eradicate all of those 
obstacles then the pure light of science would flood into the minds of our individual citizens and suddenly we would find a path opening for stopping climate change that is not the way i think most people uh, think and reason and act in the world what they do is actually be motivated by stories, by the stories that they hear from their parents when they're young, uh, from their peers when they're teenagers or students, from the media, from celebrities, from the elders in mytholo mythological or religious form. These are the stories that actually motivate and animate change in the world. Pachari was fundamentally wrong in his proclamation back in 2014. And so I think this whole notion of storytelling that Sarah and Claire put before us is really uh, important. I, I think, and it also, with a wicked problem like climate change, if we understand climate change as a wicked problem, um, problems that are slippery to define or impossible to define and certainly defy singular solutions, uh, where we mobilize actually different core values and beliefs about the nature of the problem and indeed the nature of the solutions, then for issues like climate change that are wicked, it actually is understanding stories that perhaps is even more important than getting scientific facts uh, on the table. And the idea of listening to these motivating stories um, is really important for questions and issues like uh, that, that are wicked, uh, such as climate change. And I would also extend this more broadly to our understandings of democracy. Um, if we indeed do hold to a particular notion of the public sphere as being one that is deliberative, that is open to protagonists as citizens or citizens as protagonists, then we should pay very careful attention to the stories that these protagonists bring to the table and listen to those stories. They may be uncomfortable to us. They may be actually very foreign. They may speak in a strange language we don't understand, or they're rooted in a particular worldview or sets of beliefs and values that we are very antagonistic toward. And yet these will be their stories. And in deliberative democracies, we, I think at a peril, begin to censor these stories that are allowed to circulate. And we've seen this around the edges already beginning to happen in some cases with climate change, this idea of censorship. There are some people who do not warrant uh, media time or air time uh, or uh, other forms of deliberation. And I think that is a dangerous path that we head down. And I think again, Sarah and Claire's book um, rebalances perhaps the uh, the arguments here uh, about with, with their claim about story listening and of course the evidence um, based politicians uh, their point that, that we need to expand our understanding of what evidence and what constitutes evidence is very very timely the final point just a, a I and mean, I just love this idea um, of beginning to think of stories that are circulating in public spaces as multiple uh, or even using, I think, uh, Claire's term uh, as ensembles uh, of narratives. This is a phrase that those of us in climate modeling are very familiar with, the ensemble, model ensembles. Uh, and in fact, scientists have gone through this whole cycle uh, of, of increasingly recognizing the importance of ensemble uh, modeling, which are ways of capturing the uncertainty, the epistemic uncertainty, and the stochastic uncertainty in the way in which science operates but actually seeing multiple stories and circulation as ensembles as a way of better representing and capturing the uncertainties and the ambiguities and the pluralities of how people make sense of their world. Not that, uh, you know, with an ensemble approach, you're not highlighting any one model or any one narrative as being the truth, but as a collective, as an ensemble uh, of stories or of models, you actually provide policy and other decision makers with a better basis upon which to inform and to guide policy. So this book is so full of fruitful and provocative claims that I have already started recommending it to my students and to my colleagues 
and will continue to do so, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. We've got a lot of great questions come in. So what I will do is um, try to get through as many as possible and direct them to somebody to answer uh, rather than asking everybody to pile in and answer each question. And the first one is from Rick Davis and it's very straightforward. And it's, how do you do this? How do you encourage story listening skills and um, uh, what are the practicalities of it? So I think either Claire or Sarah for that. Um, uh, you do it in uh, manifold and multiple ways. Um, so if you want to build narrative literacy, you need proper humanistic education threaded through the curriculum from the lowest to the highest levels. If you want to do it within structures of governance and advisory structures, then you need to start by, well, you don't need to. But one of the things you could do is say, OK, uh, just as you would gather evidence from science, you know, what, where, where do we go to gather the evidence that we need to address this question? And there you would look for experts with that expertise or you would look for experts that can pass you on to somebody who has that expertise. You have to be conscious of your own lock in and your own narrative framings and seeing only the stories that are salient or visible to you and that's why you go elsewhere to get knowledge from other people as well and you have to be careful coming back to Genevieve's example about the the whale we, we talk about um charismatic megafauna which Mike will know is also a term from um climate science um we talk about those kinds of stories you have to be able to ascertain what we call metonymic legitimacy and metonymy is a term from rhetoric where a part stands for a whole so a charismatic story can be really productive if it's metonymically legitimate if it if it mobilizes or as in Peter's example with the solar flare, mobilizes um, good, you know, action that enables good decisions. If it's not metonymically legitimate, you need to be able to know that and you need expertise to advise you. Um, Claire, did you want to add? Just to say, uh, I, 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 would, I would start with any existing system and say, um, how can I begin to incorporate narrative evidence into it? So if it's SAGE or the IPCC or um, particular advisory council or a new evidence synthesis report of the kind that many institutions and, and um, uh, think tanks and others do, um, then start by saying, what are the relevant stories here and what can I learn from them? Thank you both. So I'm going to link a couple of questions now. Um, one is from um, uh, Carolyn Ashurst, who is asking, um, are you expecting policymakers to read novels and uh, take those into account on any particular issue? And there's a, a related question, I think, about the role of journalism. And this is from Kim Hayek. Um, your example is all about novels, um, but are there other kinds of narratives that you want policymakers to start taking account of? Now, maybe I'll turn to Genevieve um, uh, to start on this one. Thanks. I don't think there's any particular genre or, or kind of mode of, of narrative that anyone particularly needs to, to be engaging with here. Um, any kind of, of story, as, as we've been uh, discussing, it's about the kind of story listening and the kind of the affect that a, that a, that a narrative has upon um, an individual kind of group society more broadly for me this is about sort of um surfacing the the, the heuristics the biases that are part of using narrative as a sense making tool and understanding the limitations and the frames around it and you can do that with any kind of, of story i think it would be great if more politicians um and policy makers engage with a with a you know a rich diet of literature um, in a sense more you know really varied sort of five five of your um you know fruit and veg a day let's let's get kind of five different kinds of stories into the diets of, of the people who are making life and death decisions for, for our cultures but just consuming isn't enough it's about really kind of thinking hard about what's what's going in um, and some things will be more or, more or less helpful. Um, it really is about, I think, trying to become literate about the stories that we consume. Um, there's a term that I think most of us are now familiar with the idea of kind of futures literacy. That's something that, that Sarah, and Claire, Sarah and, and Claire's book really champions. This idea of kind of really thinking through what you're, what you're consuming um, in terms of the stories that you're, you're bringing forward. And that I think that level of literacy would also help us as 
story listeners in, in society to sort of challenge the stories that we're being fed in the news media, um, just test, you know, the, the headlines, you know, is X doing Y? Uh, with a question mark, probably not because of the framing device, thinking about the genres which shape the stories that are fed to us and exposing the limitations with climate crisis. Is this going to be an overcoming the monster plot? Is it going to be a quest narrative where we're all on in, in the team together trying to achieve something? Thinking about those framings, uh, which I would think is really important for all of us here. Diane, can I come in on that? Because actually, I think it's really important to, to pick up on both those points. Um, no, we are not at all suggesting that policymakers need to go and read more novels. Um, we state explicitly in the book that that's not what we're arguing. We're not aligned with the idea that if everybody read, read Jane Austen before they went into Sage, then they'd make better decisions because they'd be more empathetic people. The whole chapter, the first chapter, destroys that argument, I hope. Um, uh, no more would we expect uh, Matt Hancock to go and have become an expert in epidemiology to make his decisions. We would not expect a policymaker to become an expert in stories. There has to be the mediation of expertise in order to give you access to people whose living it is to read across or imbibe across stories and analyze them and understand how they're functioning. So not at all what we're suggesting. And the second thing is say all our examples aren't novels, although I did talk about one in the in the presentation. If you look at the slides, we talk about um, na narratives that circulate in social media. We talk about the Pope's encyclical in the book. We talk about Ted Shepard's storyline approach to ex explaining extreme weather events. So our understanding of story is radically capacious um, and novels. And one of the reasons to foreground novels is because fiction is often excluded from what counts as a cognitive story um, because it's seen to be this thing over here. But actually we have a, a spectrum of stories from something that you would tell your friend to something that's a published novel, to a news story, um, or to a narrative that's incorporated into, as Claire was saying, a scientific model. So it's much, much broader than that. But I guess one of the arguments from the book is that you have to include what people think of as fiction within, within that spectrum, or you're emitting a um, a part of the story world. Thank you, Sarah. Um, the next question is from Gabs McClough, who's a fellow economist of mine, and um, he's asking about whether different cultures are better at listening and um, suggests that maybe the Maoris are better. Maybe we in the West are doomed not to be good listeners. Peter, is that something you'd like to pick up? Well, I think it, that raises the whole issue, which I think comes back to the previous question as well, that it's not just, and the whole point of the book is, it's not just about telling the story, it's actually having the story properly heard. And there, I think the skill of a good evidence broker or of or any kind is actually being aware of what is effective with the person you're talking to or, or providing the story to. <clears throat> and so, certainly in New Zealand, where we deal with people of collective cultures and more individualistic cultures, one needs to shift the paradigm according to who you're talking to. So in dealing, for instance, with vaccine hesitancy at the moment, given that Maori think very much in intergenerational terms, it's really that the, the way through vaccine hesitancy is often in terms of protecting their genealogy, their whakapapa, their over generations, as opposed to talking about the individual and what it will do to the individual. So again, and there are many other examples I could give. And I think if you think about land use, farmers in New Zealand are thinking generally about their return on their, their um, investment in the land. Maori are thinking generally, and I'm generalizing obviously, in terms of multiple generations, because the land will never leave their ownership. And so you, one ends up having to have and should have narratives that will be told differently if you're talking about environmental change or, or, or taking vaccination according to the audience you're dealing with. In my experience, I, have to, I had to choose when I was science advisor for a decade, different ways of talking to different ministers because their personalities, their persona are different and different ways of talking leads to different, it, it shows listening which is more effective if you match the story approach to the person you're talking to. Really interesting. Thank you, Peter. Um, 
I'm going to direct the next one to Mike. It's about deliberation, which you mentioned, and I think it was Claire mentioned in the opening presentation. And um, could you say more about how story listening skills sit alongside deliberative skills or deliberative processes? Uh, yeah, well, I think a couple of things are, are, are obvious. First of all, about is that is actually having your ears open. <laughs> you know if, if deliberation is, is going to work it, it, it can't be a monologue it, it actually has to be a dialogue and in a dialogue your ears have to be open you have to be actually listening actually listening very carefully to what your protagonist is arguing or bringing forth so those skills of listening are essential within uh, deliberative settings um and i i think you know another example of where this may be you know there's a whole idea of story listening could could be really interesting, given how we've seen the emergence, certainly in climate change in the last three or four years of citizens assemblies uh, in a number of different jurisdictions. The idea of gather, gathering together quasi random uh, groups of citizens to deliberate on climate questions and climate policies. In those settings, uh, citizens assemblies, people will come with their own stories in a way that they are using to shape and to guide their interpretation of scientific evidence uh, and indeed, the way in which they express their values and hopes and aspirations for the future. So, in a citizens assembly, and I'm not sure, you know, I'm not, I'm not participating in these myself directly. I know people are looking at these and studying citizens assemblies. Usually, what you find is that they're teed up by a group of invited experts who, who who come in to the citizens group and say, you know, this is what climate economics is saying. This is what climate models are. Et cetera, et cetera, what would be very good would be to actually have people come into those citizens' assemblies and say, look, you know, there are a range of different stories uh, that are in circulation about climate change or indeed about other value based uh, dispositions and sensitize the citizens' debates and deliberations to those different stories. So I think, I think there are different ways in which the, the, the deliberative democracy or the deliberative democrat could pay much greater attention to story listening. There are loads more questions and five minutes left. Um, so there's a cluster of them, which I'm going to try to wrap up in one question and see um, which panel members would like to pick it up and then give the last word to Sarah and Claire. And they're about misinformation, false narratives, and how does um, the idea of story listening uh, distinguish between good narratives and whose are the good narratives? Um, false narratives, misinformation, and uh, control of people by their governments, and also um, a question about missing narratives, which are the stories that we're not able to listen to because they're not, not as readily available. So that's quite a broad question. So let me first ask if any of the three panellists, Genevieve, Michael, or Peter, want to uh, pick up on that. Well, I, think I think it's an important you... question to... Ah. I think it's the key issue of the age. I mean, we're living in a world drowned in misinformation, disinformation, manipulated information alongside uh, <clears throat> the world of, 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 of where the separation between reality and, and non-reality has become more blurred. And I think that is the issue. I mean, in my world, of course, I had to deal with that issue all the time. But, it, but it's accumulating in size and in effect. And that's why, as I think Sarah pointed out, we need experts. We need the mediator in between, the broker between the collection of stories, whether they come from science or from literature or from anywhere else, and the people making the, the deliberative choice. As Mike's just pointed out, uh, and I think the way that deliberative democracy can work through participatory means, through partic things like citizens' juries, you can dissect that out and explore that. But you're not going to just do it by having a, a contestation in the virtual world between what one set of Twitter storms says and people trying to resist it. And so we, we're having to learn new ways of exploring this interface between different levels of reliability of information. I would just add one thing before handing over to Sarah and Claire to answer the difficult part of the question. I, I would also just throw in, as well as what we or others may feel is disinformation 
or erroneous stories is also to pay attention to the hidden stories that are not being expressed explicitly. You know, so science itself has got a, a whole range of different stories that it uses to communicate scientific facts. But often the, the, those, those stories are, are never exposed or revealed. So it's also the hidden stories that need to be foregrounded as well. Uh, I think if we're going to do deep, deep story listening, we call it deep story listening, exposing stories that are not e expressed as such. About to run out of time, so let me hand over to Claire and Sarah for one minute each. Thank you. Um, so my one minute would um, would uh, be first of all on the subject that's uh, the topic that just was asked uh, was remember we have expressed throughout it's about plural evidence so it's always stories alongside of other forms of evidence that will begin to answer some of the questions about misinformation and so forth. But so that's that. Uh, the other is just that what we're trying with this framework is to make it easier. Um, because there are just the four functions to begin to uh, think about how to use narrative evidence and by making it a little bit easier and kind of putting aside all of these other big fears and hopes that we've been talking about and the, and the unruly nature of stories by making it a little bit easier to approach these cognitive functions to have a go and start bringing them in um, because that way we really will expand and enrich debate. Sarah. Um, yes, yeah, so to take both of them, we talk um, uh, at length in various places of the book about narrative deficits, which is our word for the stories that are either missing because they haven't been told at all, or the stories that are not being heard because they're coming from places that aren't normally listened to. And so we suggest throughout the book various ideas, various ways in which story listening can help to both understand how dominant stories are working, but also work to find out and hear relevant non-dominant dominant stories. In relation to the question of post-truth, it's one we've thought of a lot and also that we address in the book on numerous occasions. Um, you cannot have a toddler approach to stories. You cannot say, I don't like them, so if I close my eyes, they're not there. We don't do that with any other part of the world. What we do is try to study it and understand it in order to contend with its functions and its effects. And that's what Story Listening, the book, is trying to help people do in relation to narratives. So it's not part of the slippery bandwagon down to there being no facts at all. It's understanding that stories can provide you with facts not necessarily in terms of their content, which could be against all other evidence, false, but because maybe that story is circulated within a collective identity and by understanding how that story is shared and forms that collective identity, you can make better decisions about a policy that might pertain or be relevant to them. So it's stories as, as, as conveying knowledge in the ways that they circulate as well as the things that they say and being unable to understand the difference between those two things. Thank you so much uh, to all of you. It's been a fascinating discussion um, and we could obviously carry on for a long time, but we've run out of time now. Um, thank you to everybody for participating and for the questions which we will save to, um, uh, for the panel to look at later. But you can also continue the conversation on the website storylistening.co.uk. And please also join us for more Bennett Institute events. We've got two next week, the Levy Hume Lecture on December 1st, and our annual public policy lecture on December 2nd details on our website. But thank you to all of you. Thank you to the panel. Thank you to Claire and Sarah. And thank you to all the audience participants. Bye, everybody.